Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another story in the life of the old time rock and roller. In this chapter, we will begin in 1979. I had just returned from Muscle Shoals to Rhode Island and was looking to get into a band. When I got right to town, I called Steve Jablecki, my old bandmate, and he said, come crash at my apartment for a few days. And I did. The first night I was there, I had gone to bed, he and his girlfriend had gone to bed, and after about an hour of lying on the couch, I hear him say, hey Howie, come in here. And I said, okay, so I walked in, and he said, I want you to have sex with my girlfriend. And I was a little blown away, but she was just a, a beautiful woman, so I obliged. And the next day, I saw my mom, and I started looking for an apartment. I found one, a little flat above a real estate office. I wanted to get playing right away, but I had no money. So I looked in the paper, and I found a display ad job for $5 an hour. In those days, that was pretty good money. So I went down and applied and got the job. And I met another guy named Al Bradley. Well, after about two weeks, Al came over to my house and he brought some weed and we got high and I pulled out my guitar and started playing and he said, holy smokes. He said, anybody who can play like you do needs to be in a band. What are you doing putting up display ads? And I said, Al, you're absolutely right. So I got on the phone and I called my old high school drummer, Dave Brooks. And Dave said he was playing with a couple of guys who used to go to the Episcopal Conference Center that were also counselors. I was too. And that's where my first band, the Oxbow Incidents, got started. So Dave introduced me to Jack Armitage, who was a year younger than me. He was playing rhythm guitar and singing. Jim Mitchell, also a year younger, he was playing conga and singing. Jocko Safford, who was a pretty good bass player from Barrington, also a, a, a year younger, and a piano player named Brian. I don't recall his last name. He was really well classically trained, but didn't really have any rock chops or anything. So we got together, we rehearsed, and we decided to call the band The Spies. And Al Bradley was the road manager. So he designed our posters and our bumper stickers and he had a pickup truck where he rode us around in the gigs and so forth. Well, Steve Jablecki had opened up an eight track studio called Hot Tracks. And I called Charlie Flannery, my old drummer from Choker in the Wadsworth Mansion, and we cut, we recut uh, It's Over that I had done with Steve Perry. We did a whole different vibe and feel to it. <laughs> Special way 
we did one that I sang called Rumble Tumble and an instrumental. But the quality wasn't really what I needed. So I read in the Boston Phoenix about a place called Longview Farms. A guy named Gil Markle had opened up this big farm and had a place for everyone to stay and the Rolling Stones were even going to go out there and rehearse. Well, I had a few friends named Jeff and John, guitar players. They were gay, but really great guys. And they were working now at Longview as cooks. And one of them was an engineer. So I called them up and I said, I need to book some time out there. And he said, okay, and I booked a session. Well, I went back to the spies and I said, look, here's a new song I wrote called 25 Years of Rock and one that me and Bobby Zinner wrote and did in the forest called Hard to Lose. So we drove out to Longview and we recorded them. Jim Mitchell sang the lead and I had them pressed up and my first 45 was for sale in the Harvard Coop. I still have the first $10 bill that I made from selling three on consignment. Well, we rehearsed and pretty soon, it wasn't long after we were established that Brian, the keyboard player, decided he was going back to college to pursue a degree in music. So we needed a keyboard player. Well, that night, Raymond Victor called me from San Francisco and said, hey man, what's going on? I need a change of scenery. I said, well, I got a band and we need a keyboard player, so come on out. So Ray arrived a week later. And let me tell you, when we got to rehearsal, Ray set up and he started playing the piano and they were amazed at his chops. Then he started singing and he was the best singer in the group by far. So they were stoked. I mean, we were at it. Well, soon after Ray came, Dave Brooks, the drummer, decided he was going back to college. And Dave had not progressed that much since our high school band days. He had the same couple of beats, which were good, but after playing with Ron Bushy from the Iron Butterfly, recording with Roger Hawkins at the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section and Ty Grimes in LA. We needed a better drummer too. So I called Rob and Rob wasn't doing anything. So we flew him out. Well, Ray and I drove up to LaGuardia Airport in New York to pick him up. And we rolled maybe seven or eight joints for the ride. And we, we found Rob and we got his drums at the baggage terminal and started headed back. Well, Ray had a CB radio and he was a real wise guy. And he was mouthing off to the truckers, but they didn't know who it was. But it was getting pretty hot and heavy on the, the, on the, the CB radio. So all of a sudden we see this one big truck pulling like right up on our ass. And we hear, we know you're that guy in the blue van in front of us and we're going to get you. And we were like, holy shit, step on it, Ray. Uh, so we made it back to Rhode Island and Rob complained all the way that we didn't have enough joints. And I, I kind of agreed with him because the, time, the first time he and I drove to San Francisco in the Kathy McDonald band, we each dropped a hit of acid, had quaaludes, a gram of coke, about a half an ounce of pot, and so by comparison, he was right, we picked him up a little light. Our first job with Rob was at Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel opening for Dr. John. So we got to meet the Night Tripper, and it was a, a fabulous first gig. Later on, we were booked to play, I think it was called Salva Regina, and it was an all-girls college, a Halloween party. So we played there, and for some reason, Jocko couldn't make it. 
So I called Mark Aubin, my old friend from Blessings from LA that we had recorded Not Another Girl with, and Mark came down and sang and played bass. We had a really good time. It was hard to get Rob out of there because he was about to get laid, but we said, look, there, there's three of us and one of you, and you're the only one who's hooked up, so you know, I'll give you five minutes, and then the band's pulling out. Uh, so we played up in New Hampshire and Vermont and all over the place, New England, and then I decided to make another recording out at Longview Farms, and I took the song Cape Town Retreat, and I turned it into You'll Never Be Out of My Heart. I just checked on eBay and I found a copy of 25 Years of Rock backed by Hard to Lose on vinyl on the Longview Farm label and it had just sold for $7. I guess vinyl's coming back. So some of the gigs we had were pretty funny. We had a, a St. Patrick's Day gig at o O'Toole's or Irish Tavern on St. Patrick's Day. And as we were setting up, the bartender said, you guys play Irish music, right? And of course we didn't, so Ray started singing, oh, Danny boy, I hear the pipers are calling, and all of his little Irish limericks and stuff that he knew. So the guy said, oh, okay, great, and he left, and. We played the night and he showed up about 11 o'clock and said, hey, this is Irish music. But it was too late then, kind of like a scene out of the Blues Brothers, only there was no chicken wire to throw the empty beer bottles at. But we, we went over well. Then we, we moved on, we played a, a club in Woonsocket. Well, we had these bumper stickers that said the spies and Ray saw some on the building but they had been taped to the glass. Well, Ray took it off and just stuck it right on the window. Well, he had been forgetting some lyrics, and I said, Ray, I don't want you drinking tonight. Do me a favor, just no booze, and the arrangements will be better. He said, okay, and I saw him, he was drinking water all night. Well, we got to the end of the night, and I said, Whew, I'm hot, that was pretty good, and I grabbed his water, and I took a sip of it and it <laughs> spit it out. It was straight vodka. He had been drinking all night long. Well, then the club owner wouldn't pay us until Ray had, took a razor blade and completely scraped the sticker off the window. So we were out on the sidewalk till about three in the morning trying to get that crap off. We had another gig at the Old Ferry Way Tavern up on the North Shore somewhere. And it was again like the Blues Brothers. Ray had a big bullhorn on the top of his truck. And we were driving down Thayer Street in Providence where Brown University was and all the students. And we were saying, come to the Old Ferry Way Tavern tonight, eight to midnight, the Old Ferry Way Tavern. And we got a big kick out of it. Well, we played the gig and it was good. And when we were dressing out, we, um, we were changing in the kitchen. And we happened to look in the refrigerator and there were all these frozen lobsters. And somebody convinced us that we were so good that night we deserved a tip of a couple of lobsters. So, sad to say they came home with us, but they weren't wasted. So, we, um, we kept playing and we had a gig at a place called the Agassiz House in New Hampshire. And that was a great old hotel. It could have been haunted for all we know. But the bar and the club was downstairs. And then on every floor, it was a hotel. So we had our own section of the hotel. And 
everybody just partied and went crazy. Uh, the last night we were there, we were doing a song of mine called Wild in the Streets, and my brother and sister were there, Steve and Kathy, and they were really digging it. And I was playing like mad, and Jocko made a remark that I was showing off for my family, but I was just getting into it and putting on a show like a showman should. Well, Ray started, he, he had a, a Halon fire extinguisher attached to his keyboard in case of emergency. So he started spraying the crowd and everybody with Halon and getting into it and we're going wild on, on the end of Wild in the Streets. And finally he felt guilty for spraying everybody else so he just put it over his head and sprayed himself completely. But Al Bradley was with us and man, we had such a good time. Then we moved on to Waterville, Maine. Uh, it's like the locomotive place or, uh, man, I can't remember the name of that place. But at the end of the night, two girls latched on to me and Al and invited us back to their place. Well, I said, what's your name? And she said, Mary Ellen. And Al said to the other one, what's your name? And she said, my name's Mary Ellen. So we said, okay, Mary Ellen one, Mary Ellen two. So we went back to their house and maybe had a beer, smoked something immediately right into the sex. And then Mary Ellen one and two wanted to switch. And so we went out into the yard and there was a lake right there. It was really cool. Actually, it was August and it was pretty chilly, but, uh, but we were having good times. That's the point. Well, one night there was a bar behind my house and Rob and Ray went down drinking at the bar. And Rob had a temper and he got mad at something and he grabbed the Formica bar top and he just pulled it up and it ripped the whole bar counter right off the thing. And I'm sure he didn't mean to do that, but um, they weren't very happy. Well, so Rob came back to the house and he decided it was too crowded in our two bedroom apartment, him sharing a room with, with Ray or one bedroom. So he said, I'm going back to LA. And we said, okay, fine, we'll carry on without you. Well, the next day, Ray went to the bar and he didn't come home all night. And the next, and so the following day, Sunday, he drove up in like a Lincoln. And I saw him in the parking lot and he said, I was so good, she gave me the car. I said, oh, that's cool. So we, we hung out and he, he made his famous Ray's ribs. And he said, okay, I've got to go return the car. So he had no sooner driven off then I hear a knock at my front door. We always use the side door. So I opened it up and it was a private detective from California. And I said, hey, what's going on? He says, well, I'm, uh, you know, Paul Drake, private eye with the Perry Mason Detective Agency, and, you know, uh, or the Drake Detective Agency. And I'm looking for a guy named Raymond Victor. Uh, he hadn't made payments on his van in two years and they want to repossess it. And I said, well, why are you here? He said, well, the last known evidence on him was a phone call he made here to your residence and then he disappeared. And I said, wow, well, I haven't talked to him since then. I haven't seen him, but you know, leave me your card and if I see him, I'll give you a call or I hear from him. He said, okay, great. And he left and hadn't been gone two minutes when Ray pulled up in the parking lot with the blue van. When I, he came in and I told him the story and he completely flipped out. He was totally paranoid. He grabbed all his stuff, packed up the van and within a half an hour he was on the road back to California. So we had some great times with the spies and at one time we were pretty darn good. That was the story of the spies in 1979, book by Undercover Limited. We had a great time 
And Al Bradley is still one of my very best friends to this day. And I'm still in touch with the other guys, although Dave Brooks sadly has passed away. So I will see you on the next adventure. There's no doubt about that. In the meantime, if you'd like to hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell if you haven't already, that would be a solid for me. I'd appreciate that. And don't forget, keep love in your heart, a song in your head, and I will see you down the story highway on the next adventure of the old time rock and roller. So long for now, my friends. You'll never be